This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Antagonism always comes from legalism toward grace. Listen, never the other way around. Grace does not antagonize legalism, but legalism antagonizes grace. Those that operate in the grace of God love. If you truly operate in the grace of God, you love everybody. But if you truly operate in legalism, you can't stand people that teach the grace of God. You call them slippery. You call them, you know, they teaching, you know, greasy grace and all this. And I again, you can, I again agree. You can get so far out in grace, you become almost not needed. You know, or you simply become a place where you become licensed to sin and grace never gives you a license to sin. In fact, the love of God and the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit always sets up a barrier and and tells you not to do that. The grace of God teaches us to even deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Glad to have you today. This is part number two and uh, this will be the ending of it today. We started yesterday talking about two churches, the church at Jerusalem, the church at Antioch. And what I want to talk about was the difference between a church that revolves around basically legalism and a church that revolves around the grace of God, the comparison of the two. The church at Jerusalem was established in the beginning, God said, from Jerusalem. And he intended from this church, the gospel would be spread around the world to both Jews and Gentiles. God would raise up different leaders leadership out of the church to go to the Jews, the Gentiles. Peter was mainly raised up to go to the Jewish people. And Paul was raised up to go to the Gentile world. But again, this wouldn't be till later. But in the very beginning, they had such an open vision for everybody. The church was so open to every nationality, open to every type of person. In fact, in Acts chapter 6, when they chose the seven men to uh, to take over the first deacon's position in the church, most every name that was there is Greek names. And so because the church was looking at a conflict between the Greek widows and the Jewish widows, and the Greek widows felt like they were being neglected because of the women that were there that were Jewish, and many of the church was Jewish leadership. So that's why when they chose them, they said, find men full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, and uh, that were strong in the Holy Spirit. Then make them. And so they did. That was the criteria that they looked at first, but the main ones they chose were all Greek men. So again, we find the combination in the church, but later on the church progressed and progressed. And finally, by the time we come to chapter 10, anybody that did anything and had anything to do with people outside of the Jewish people, such as Peter was brought in one day and griped at why did you go to this, you know, this city over here, Caesarea, and preach to Gentiles and then eat with them? But he told the story how it was anointed by the Holy Spirit, called by the Holy Spirit, and that they received the word of God, received the Holy Spirit, and then and so the, the church rejoiced. I mean, the Jerusalem church applauded this, but God saw the handwriting on the wall. This is how the church was going. And in chapter 11, he raised up the church at Antioch. And of course, but what happened was, was certain people went out and began to preach in Antioch. And so Barnabas went there. And when he got there, he was so shocked, but he was so happy. He was so satisfied to find people that were in grace. I mean, he was so raised up in this church in Jerusalem. As it progressed, he kind of like that frog in the water. He just stayed there as it got hotter and hotter and didn't really detect the changes going on around him until it became so far away from what it started that by the time he got to Antioch, he saw how it used to be at the church in Jerusalem. And he was loved the grace of God. That's the essence of the chapter that Barnabas went there and he knew they needed a church. So he went over and found Paul and he brought Paul back and Paul and Barnabas helped to establish the church that was there. That's the place where they're first called Christians at Antioch. The Jew, uh, the uh, disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And so again, we found out it was a giving church that they gave to the needs of the churches of Judea, but we very rarely find anybody from the church at Jerusalem giving to the needs of other churches. The church at Jerusalem became more and more back toward the law, tending toward the law. Listen, the law is fine. It's holy, just, and good. And it has a place today, but not for salvation, not for spirituality. It teaches about the Lord. And Jesus didn't do away. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. That's the beauty of it. The law today is still here, but we don't fulfill it by keeping it. We fulfill it by walking in the love of God, the power of God, the grace of God. That's how we keep the law. And if you walk in the Holy Spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
if you take his word into your heart, then you will not sin against him. In essence, you keep the law by doing that. And even Jesus said, if you can keep two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbors yourself, all the law and the prophets hang on those two verses of scripture. If you can keep those two, well, it was impossible to keep those two until Jesus came and fulfilled the law and then gave us his power to become children of God. And by the power of the spirit, we walk in love. And when we walk in love again, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so we love the Lord our God through the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the word. We love our neighbors, ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the word of God. And that's how we fulfill the law today. But the purpose of the law today is to still teach us. We don't throw it out. We go back and study it and see Jesus in every commandment, Jesus in every law, and especially Jesus in every sacrifice. We see him in the tabernacle and the temple and each piece of furniture that was there. All that depicts Jesus Christ. Uh, but again, you can go back and look at the shadows and learn about Jesus, but thank God we stand today in the reality of what Jesus did. Acts chapter 13 and verses one through three, this is where Paul again received his call to the ministry and Barnabas to go with him in the beginning. Later, Barnabas becomes the pastor of the church. Acts 13, verses one through three, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Antioch's reputation for teaching grace and the power of the Holy Spirit was known everywhere, including Jerusalem. The leadership at Jerusalem became jealous and needed to know what was going on at Antioch. James, the, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, became so legalistic and other legalistic leaders, they finally sent Peter to spy on the church at Antioch. And guess what happened when Peter came to Antioch? When Peter got there, he saw such grace he didn't want to leave. He was supposed to report back to Jerusalem all he found, but he forgot. They didn't have a hotel room, apparently, so they put him in the house of some Gentiles, and he started eating with the Gentiles. Probably the house top vision returned to him about what happened there, and he found himself surrounded by such grace and such freedom. He loved what he saw and didn't report back. So what happened was, since he wouldn't report back, they sent some legalistic Pharisees over there to see what was going on. And when Peter saw them walking through the door into the church, he freaked out. He moved out of the house with the Gentiles. He began to walk back under the law because he was afraid of people and he brought division into the church. Let's take a look at it in Galatians chapter two. Turn to there because in Galatians, Paul makes reference back to what happened at Antioch when the legalistic Judaizers came in and found Peter fellowshipping, eating with Gentiles and participating in the church service without calling them back. Galatians chapter two, take a look at verses 11 through 14. Here it says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he had to be blamed. For before that certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not honest about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all of them, if you being a Jew live after the manner of the Gentiles, that's why you're here in Antioch, and not as do the Jews, then why do you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Antagonism always comes from legalism toward grace. Listen, never the other way around. Grace does not antagonize legalism, but legalism antagonizes grace. Those that operate in the grace of God love. If you truly operate in the grace of God, you love everybody. But if you truly operate in legalism, you can't stand people that teach the grace of God. You call them slippery. You call them, you know, they teaching, you know, greasy grace and all this. And I again, you can, I again agree. You can get so far out in grace, you become almost non needed. You know, or you simply become a place where you become licensed to sin and grace never gives you a license to sin. In fact, the love of God and the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit always sets up a barrier and, and tells you not to do that. The grace of God teaches us to even deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And again, yet our freedom is not to be used by the flesh to sin. And even Paul at one time became legalistic in the church over Mark at Antioch. In chapter 15 of the book of Acts, go back with me to Acts, and we're going to find out here that even though the church at Antioch was so great that what happened was is that 
Peter fell. We saw that. And here's the point. It says even Barnabas was carried away. Barnabas was the pastor of the church. And then all of a sudden the church there at Antioch became divided. And the Jews and the Gentiles in the church became divided toward each other. And of course, if you can divide, you can conquer. Paul had to come in and stop this thing. And since the entire congregation was guilty of this, the Jews on one side versus the Gentiles on the other, and Barnabas, their pastor, caught up with the Jews and now against the Gentiles. And Peter was the one that started this whole thing because when the leadership came in, instead of standing up to the leadership of Jerusalem, he kowtowed to them. He backed off and he became a hypocrite and then separated from the Gentiles, wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. And this thing just split the church down the middle. Barnabas, even the pastor, was carried away with his hypocrisy. And of course, Paul had to come in. And the only way Paul could handle it, he had to chew out Peter in front of the entire congregation. If Peter would have done this and nobody knew it, he would have gone to Peter separately. And if Peter wouldn't listen, he'd gone to the church leadership and talked to them. But this had to be done in front of the entire congregation. And when he did, whatever he said to Peter just hit the people. And basically this, if living like a Jew is correct, and you come here and live like a Gentile, then why now are you trying to get the Gentiles to go back and live like the Jews? If that was wrong and now you're right, then why are you trying to take these people that are right and make them wrong? And he simply started with that and just shut down Peter in front of everybody. I'm sure Barnabas must have been repenting, and the church snapped back and went right back to, again, the grace of God, and great favor was on that place. But again, at that time, Peter was on the outs with the church at Jerusalem as Paul was on the outs with the church at Jerusalem as these people were. And they began over here looking down on everybody else from Jerusalem that didn't believe like they did and didn't look like they did. And pretty soon again, we know what happened. The church became so legalistic. Eventually the city was destroyed and the church at Jerusalem was destroyed. But the works toward the Gentiles that came out of Antioch got greater and greater to where even the great church at Ephesus began out of that, one of the largest churches in the entire ancient world. And again, they started six other churches, and that is the seven churches of Asia found at the end of chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three of the book of Revelation. In chapter 15, let's take a look at it in uh, verse 36 through 41. Tell you what, we'll take this up when we get back. We'll start with that verse of scripture when we get back. In the meantime, I have a book here on the book of Acts. And uh, when you order this book, again, I want to remind you to do one thing. Also order my book on Galatians. You'll find it there on the website because Galatians goes back and fits itself into the book of Acts in these particular stories I'm talking about. And so help helps to identify these two churches and the separation, the difference, the drastic difference between these two churches and the fact that the church at Antioch had to be set up because the church at Jerusalem was sliding downhill so fast. When churches get into legalism, God will not allow churches like that to prosper for very long. He immediately starts looking towards someone else. Do we pray for these churches? Yes. Do we pray they'll snap out of it? Yes. But today we're seeing churches in our time period shut down that are that used to be great churches, but they got so into legalism, the church signed size begin to shrink. They didn't look out to the needs of the world, didn't fulfill the Great Commission. It seemed like their whole idea is we got to perfect these people coming to church and they do it through their works. The Word of God does teach about uh, us growing, us becoming disciples, us becoming tempered in the lifestyle we have and turning away from the sin. But it's not because of legalism, because we grit our teeth and decide we're going to do this. No, we do it by the grace of God, the power of God, and realize in ourselves, even born again within ourselves, we can't do it. We have to depend on the power of God. So the announcer is going to come on and tell you how you can have a copy of this book. And by the way, when you do, why don't you order the book of Galatians 2? I know you will be blessed. I will see you right after the break. At the dawn of the church age, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and power to his followers. From Pentecost, they were led by his spirit to blaze a trail through the hazardous maze of pagan cultures and religious legalism. Like wildfire, the gospel spread through the known world, bringing salvation to a whole generation and triumph and trial to the church. In a New Testament commentary on Acts, Bob Yannion explores the exploits of those sent to uproot the binding vines of religion and philosophy and to sow the kingdom of God. Through evaluations of early congregations and detailed descriptions of their cities, Pastor Bob walks us through the exciting, perilous adventure of the early church. Order a New Testament commentary on Acts at bobbyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. 
You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. We find at Antioch that legalism came back in. We talked about it in the first half of this broadcast, how that Peter was sent out of the church of Jerusalem to go spy on the church at Antioch and then got so happy when he got there, saw the grace of God everywhere. Man thought, I haven't seen praise and worship like this in years, man. I haven't walked through the door without people checking on the fact, are you circumcised? Are your women giving tithes of mint and anise and cumin? Have you been baptized a certain way? I mean, all the different things that they they got legalistic over out of the law. He didn't find that this church. Everybody's accepted for who they were and how they were when they came through the door. Everybody loved each other. Saw such love in the church. He saw such acceptance in the church and again, didn't report back. And of course, his act of legalism split the church. So there we find the great man, Peter, who fell under legalism and even took Barnabas with him. And Paul was the one that straightened it out. But even Paul got legalistic at the church at Antioch. Look at chapter 15 of Acts. Take a look at verse 36. We're gonna look down through verse 41. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back to visit our brethren in every city where we had preached the word of God and see how they are doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John, who was called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take him with them, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. At this time, even Paul became legalistic. Let me tell you how he became legalistic is that the first time they took out a mark with them, they got to Pamphylia and this young man departed. Pamphylia was known for its pirates. It was filled with corruption. And when he got there, he probably his first thought is, mama didn't tell me about days like this. And here he was working for Paul and Barnabas and they probably would go out after service and talk to the ministers. But what happened to Mark? Mark had to go back to the church and maybe clean up things, you know, and then and pack up the stuff before they left and went to the hotel room, didn't get to fellowship with a lot of people. And he probably began to feel a little distant, but when they got to Pamphylia and he found out what was going on there, Paul and Barnabas woke up one morning and Mark was gone. He deserted them, didn't say a word to them, he deserted them. And so next time now, apparently between then and now, Mark has repented. And so Barnabas says to Paul, when he says, let's go out again, he says, let's take Mark back with us this time. And Paul said, no, once is enough. I'm not going back out with that kid again. And such a sharp dissension came between them that Paul and Barnabas separated from each other. This is Paul's fault. He wouldn't even take a moment to talk to Mark and find out how he'd repented. And later on, Paul had to admit he was wrong at that time. And at this time, Barnabas stood up for the grace of God. He was forgiving toward repentant Mark and was wanting to take him again. And notice how they were sent out in verse 40. It says, Paul chose Silas and departed. He went out with Silas this time, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. When he was sent out, why did the congregation send him out? They sent him out by the grace of God. They said, Paul, go on out there, but we're gonna pray for you. We're gonna pray the grace of God will get hold of you and you'll be forgiving toward this young man. And probably the church had even seen the change in Mark. Within the service where he worked, they saw him and knew he had changed, but Paul was so determined, no, he's not gonna go. And again, Paul later on saw his mistake about him. And in 2 Timothy, toward the end of Paul's ministry, he finally forgave Mark. In 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you for he is profitable to me in the ministry. He says, now I want to accept him because why? I've seen his ministry. He's proven himself. You know what? I was wrong. I now take him back. It simply comes back to this. Is there a perfect church? The answer is no. As good as Antioch was, it was not perfect. 
And we certainly know the church at Jerusalem was not perfect. It simply comes back to this. Some churches are better than others, but there is no perfect church here on earth. There was a woman that came to me one time after a church service, and she was talking about, you know, our church and all that. And she said, well, I just disagree with you on this, Pastor. And she said, I'm going to be leaving the church. I said, over one issue? Yes, Pastor, I am looking for a church. And she said, I'm looking for a perfect church. And honestly, this is what I said to her. I don't often say this, but I told her, you know what? I'll shoot you. You'll find it. She said, what do you mean? I said, it's not here on earth. You're not going to find it till you die. The only perfect church is in heaven. The only perfect pastor is Jesus. The only perfect praise and worship leader is, is angels in heaven, you know, uh, Gabriel or Michael or whoever leads the choir up there. I said, that's the only place on earth you're going to find people with stains. I don't care how great a church is. You're going to look hard enough. You're going to see it. Churches look wonderful when you first come there. You stand back and look at it like you do a painting and you go, oh, look at how exquisite, look how, oh, our church church didn't have this type of youth group and our church didn't have this kind of children's church. And oh, look how loving the, pa and his sermon just so moved me. I, I think I have found the perfect church. But once you move in and start to get involved, that's like walking up the painting and now you can see the brush marks. People have brush marks. Youth directors make mistakes and children's directors make mistakes. And on top of that, you make mistakes. I told this lady, I said, besides that, what if you did find a, per what if there was such a thing as a perfect church? You realize something? Once you got there, they wouldn't be perfect because you're not perfect. Apparently they received, per they walked into perfection without you. You weren't even needed to get there. And now you're going to walk into a perfect church. You're going to come in with your marks, your failures. You can come in with your blemishes. You're going to come in with all these things wrong in your life. And you're going to come in there and expect that church is going to change you. Or you're looking for quote, the perfect church. It does not exist here on earth. Even the church at Antioch, which lives so much longer after it. The point of it is, is churches make mistakes, but how quick are they to turn these around? When pastors teach things that are wrong and they find out one day they've taught it wrong, are they honest enough to admit they were wrong in front of their congregation? No, pride comes in. Pride is coming from your own flesh. It's the first work of the flesh. It's what caused Lucifer to fall. And he said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. His pride is what caused him to turn against God. Pride and, and thinking higher of yourself is the very first thing that's mentioned when it comes to sin. In the last days, it says that uh, there will come distress among all these things. And here's what's going to happen within the nation. It says that men will be lovers of self. From there, all other sins that are mentioned there in 2 Timothy come from that one passage, lovers of self. All the rebellion toward authority, hatred of their mother and father, uh, turning against what is good, turning over only toward evil, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, uh, seeking out out a religion, but denying the power of God. All this comes back from a love of self. And this is what happens. So again, Paul at that time, again, with that ministry coming up, again, we find out there was not a perfect church, even a perfect man that we think like Paul. Paul made mistakes. He shouldn't have gone to Jerusalem later on when in when he's being admonished after the revival at Ephesus. He wanted to go back to Jerusalem, and yet people were coming to him. There was people on the streets that came to him and said, Paul, you're not supposed to go to Jerusalem. And he defended Norma, go to Jerusalem. And then later on, uh, Agabus the prophet told him and came and bound his hand and said, this is what's going to happen to you if you go back to Jerusalem. And he still denied, said, no, I'm going to go back. And then the four daughters of Philip prophesied to him. He went to the house and they prophesied. But you know what they prophesied? They had to be prophesying to him along with every other thing that happened to him before that time. Don't you go. He still said he was going to go. And finally, his own disciples came to him and said, Paul, we really feel with all these words coming to you, you're not supposed to go to Jerusalem. Paul said, listen, even if I die, I'll preach the gospel. Noble but stupid. If God's leading you not to do something and in quote nobility, you rise up and say, I'm going to do it anyway. That is just your obstinance coming against God. Even Paul made mistakes. No one has been perfect except Jesus Christ himself. But the point of it was even David was called a man after God's own heart, not because he never failed, but because he was quick to repent. Again, I tell you, there's times when I, I remember that I taught certain things and later on, the longer I looked at it, the longer I looked at the word of God, I found I was wrong. I had to come back. I remember in the very beginning, I used to always teach that the two witnesses was uh, Elijah and Enoch because they never died. That was just common teaching. I took it. And one day as I was studying the word of God, I found out the other one was Moses. It was it was Elijah and Moses, not Enoch. Uh, the two witnesses are Jewish. Enoch was a Gentile. 
And when I began to see it, I had to come back and say, folks, I've been wrong. I've been wrong. Here's what it is. You know what? I had, I had a teacher one time, a minister one time, who was teaching something that was wrong, and he knew it was wrong, but he kept teaching it and finally got to the point where he never taught it again. He never came back and corrected it. And I had heard him. I said, you know, you used to teach this. Do you tell No, 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 I don't, I don't anymore. I said, but you know that that was wrong. Yeah, I know. I said, did you ever tell your He said, I couldn't tell my congregation. I will not stand up and say I am wrong. And my whole point was, he said, I don't want to diminish myself in their eyes. I said, are you kidding? You'll raise yourself in their eyes. The moment you admit you're human too, the congregation will breathe a sigh of relief because you know what? They're not perfect. If they say, if they see that you are willing to say, I was wrong and I'm going to do this, all of a sudden you became not only a pastor, you became human in their eyes and they understand something. God still uses human beings. I worked for Kenneth Hagin. He made a drastic mistake one day in front of the entire staff and then didn't say anything about it till the Holy Spirit woke him up one night and told him he's going to lose his ministry. He had to come in the next day and apologize for a decision he made that he told everybody it was the Lord's will. And he said, I really didn't pray much about it. And he said, I've known it's been wrong since the time I did it. I just kept hope it would working out. And did you know what? We had a number of people on staff that decided to quit because they saw that Brother Hagen made a mistake. You know what I thought? Hallelujah. If God uses Kenneth Hagin and he made a mistake and was willing to admit that God can use me because if Brother Hagin was perfect, I'm not there. I always, Again, he's not the fourth member of the Godhead. Neither is any of us. There's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All the rest of us have the nature of the flesh. And even though we're born again, we're gaining on it every day. The renewing of the mind, but still comes back to this. We still make mistakes. And Paul even made a mistake. So do you have it in your own heart to begin a church? Make grace your number one message you're going to teach, along with the other teachings of the New Testament, along with salvation, along with faith, along with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, along with the gifts of the Spirit, and the daily walk of the believer. All these things should be taught with a foundation of grace. This is the church which will last, and many will be sent out of your church to do the work of God around the world. Before I step down pastoring our church, I still attend there, but I stepped down pastoring it. We tried to go back over the 33 years I pastored because I didn't keep good records of all the people who left the church that went into the ministry. Those that ordained, I had to go back and find those ordination papers and all that to look them up. But you know what? We found out we probably sent over 100 people out of that church that began churches, worked in missions work around the world, were working in ministry organizations, and literally we lost. And we know that it still wasn't the right number. We just didn't know. I won't know till I get to heaven how many ministers were sent out. Now I'm being invited to grand churches. You say, what are grand churches? That's churches that began out of our church. The pastor was almost like treated like my son, like Timothy was with Paul. And they went out and started a church, but now they got the point where they have retired. They turn it over to somebody else. And that pastor invites me to come in. I say, who are you? He says, our pastor attended your church. I was raised in this church on your books, on your CDs and things like that. I want to invite you to come to church. And I begin to realize, man, I not only go to churches that were started out of my church, I go to churches that are now turned over to somebody that started out of our church. So how wonderful it is to see, keep these things going on. This is what a church of grace will do. A church that teaches grace and still believes the power of God in all these things and doesn't become legalistic is a church that will grow and prosper and keep on sending ministers out for ages and for ages and for ages. Please get my book on the book of Acts and also when you order it or the book also on the book of Galatians. It'll be a great blessing to you and I will see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.